Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. It is so great to have you worshiping with us today, whether you've been a part of the Cross family for a long time or whether this is your first Sunday checking us out. If you've got a copy of the bulletin there handy with you, uh, you can refer to the introduction, and if not, that is totally fine. The introduction tells us that James says to stop showing favoritism in the assembly, treating the rich visitor with more honor than the poor one. Jesus himself seems to show partiality in his first response to the Syrophoenician woman in today's gospel. Was he testing her faith in saying Gentiles don't deserve the goods meant for God's children? Or was he speaking out of his human worldview, but transcended those limits when she took him by surprise with her reply? Either way, the story tells us that God shows no partiality. Everyone who brings a need to Jesus is received with equal honor as a child and heir. You can now join me in the call to worship. We are blind, yet we believe that we see. Lord, heal our blindness. We utter words of prejudice and hatred, yet we believe that our words hold compassion. Lord, heal our thoughts and our words. Help us to see our compassionate Lord. Help us to hear Jesus' words of forgiveness. Reach into our hearts, Lord, and give us healing. Reach into our lives, Lord, and teach us to love. Amen. We gather today in the name of the one who creates, the one who liberates, and the one who heals. Amen. We now invite you to join in the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter. Like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you to help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Jesus Christ, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Lord of mercy and compassion, be with us this day as we hear of the healing love of Jesus. Remind us that we are also recipients of his compassion, and we are called to bring the same hope and love to others. Prepare us for service in his name. Amen. And we'll now have our opening hymn. Good morning. Our opening song is How Great is Our God.
And we'll now have our scripture readings for the day. Good morning, Cross family. The first reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 4 through 7a. Like streams in the desert, God comes with healing. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with, ter with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading comes from James chapter two, verses one through 17. Faith without works is dead. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes come into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also come in, and if you take notice of one 
of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while the one who is, who is poor, you say, stand here or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my, bro my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you. It is not they who drag you into court. It is not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and convicted by the law of as transgressors. For well, whoever keeps the whole, whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for it all. For the one who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. But if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is my brothers and sisters if you say have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you say to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no work, is. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 7, 24 through 37. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon was indeed gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowds and put his fingers into his ears. And then he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is be opened. And immediately his ears were opened. His tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure saying, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is God's good word for us today.
And now this sermon this morning with the words about the Syrophoenician woman, of course, made me feel some kind of way. Um, because as most women, we have been called female dogs. And so it rises up in us something very special. And I was trying to figure out, you know, did I want to go that route today and think about what Jesus was saying to her? Or did I want to do something different? And so we'll save that for another time. I decided to go with the last part, as far as opening with my sermon today, the last part of the gospel that we heard today about Jesus and the deaf and mute man. In particular, I want to talk about the fact of the word that he used. And the word that he used is from his own Aramaic language, and it has survived until now. And it is the word ephatha, which means to be opened. Now we hear in this particular gospel that Jesus's words in this gospel narrative has two healing stories for us this morning that calls loudly out to us today. In fact, we were reminded that in Mark's version of the good news, he emphasizes that what happens, whatever it might be, without any value judgment, that it occurs and it occurs immediately. Everything is urgent in Mark. You should notice that he uses this particular word quite a few times. And he felt the message of Jesus for that time was urgent. And I would say that for our time, too, it's certainly urgent. I'm inclined to think that he may be on to something, given how far we still have to go. And some urgency would be very helpful um, to us right about now. We see that Mark, the gospel writer, wants us to know that when Jesus acted or reacted, there was no delay. Jesus may have wanted to rest and retreat we know that he was doing a lot of healing, a lot of work, traveling all over the place on a regular basis, and he probably wanted to rest. But constantly, he rose to the occasion and did not choose to avoid the confrontation, no matter what the circumstances were. In our text today, Jesus delineates the line of privilege very clearly. He says, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. That's a really weird line. It's a very strange line. It, you know, arouses different kinds of emotions. And so we're thinking to ourselves, what is Jesus really saying here? Is this comment intended to stop the woman from pursuing what she came for? The healing and the deliverance of her daughter. Whether or not that is Jesus's intentions, we don't really know. But that's not what happens. This woman, we are told, seems unfazed by his comments. And so the Syrophoenician woman decides to school Jesus and play the game. And she turns his slur right back at him and replies astutely, Sir, even the little dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And you know Jesus had to just stop for a minute because we never know, of course, what Jesus is thinking. We can only contemplate. But... Jesus then goes on and announces to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she goes home and finds that that is indeed true. So what is it about the woman's reply to Jesus that makes all the difference? Instead of him getting angry that she was so astute and basically made him feel some compassion that he didn't get angry. Why does it that he ends up, why is it that he ends up affirming and healing and delivering her daughter? This woman who is clearly an outsider. Clearly she is trying to appeal to his compassion by referring to the dogs as puppies. That could have been a part of it. After all, when we think about puppies, we have a different reaction to puppies than we do to dogs. It might be very easy to dismiss a dog but we aren't going to, to deny little puppies. They are so cute and they tug at your heartstrings. Even if you're not an animal person, when you see little puppies, it sort of gives you that mm, kind of feeling. And perhaps in her putting her response the way she did, it did elicit some kind of favorable response from Jesus, as well as the fact that she also publicly was willing to go wherever she needed to go with respect to responding to Jesus because she was a parent who loved her child dearly and was going to do everything in her power to get him to heal her child, even if she was not a Jew, even if she was not an Israelite. 
And so he may have possibly been testing her faith to see just how strong it really was. And then publicly by doing this, he made a bigger point by healing her daughter and bringing restoration to this woman who was again, Greek of ancestry, considered outside and a Gentile and would not have been considered in high favor that he brought restoration to her and to her daughter and to her people publicly. The Syrophoenician woman had no such hesitancy in pursuing healing for her daughter. And this led, of course, to the confrontation with Jesus that included some of the harshest language we've ever heard him use. I'll remind you that he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Whatever the tone or the exact meaning of the terms, it is clear that Jesus's response to this woman's plea is a rejection in that particular moment of her, of her daughter, of her people, of his time. Dr. Rhodes, a former professor of mine, states that the woman demonstrates that she is open to confrontation. She invites confrontation, yet is undaunted by his rejection. It doesn't shut her down. She is actually clever enough to counter his objection and does so in such a way that she addresses any of the possible reasons for Jesus's attitude toward her. I think as human beings, we can relate for we often struggle with confrontation in most spheres of our life. It may not always be in public, but it happens just the same. Our response may include delay, denial, or possibly fight or flight. We may even try to minimize the disagreements or even question the veracity, the truthfulness of the claims made by another in order to avoid or feel justified in dismissing the confrontation altogether so we don't have to deal with it. Often though, confrontation is about fear. The fear of loss to be exact. The fear of the potential outcome, which will be different than it has been, and then the costs that are associated with it that may not be favorable to us. For example, when we look in our society, for a white male, it may involve rectifying gender or race inequities that can result in diminished opportunities for him personally, because he has historically benefited from being white and from being a male, particularly in the workplace, but also in many other sectors of life. Now you can put in whatever you'd like. It could be class, it could be sexual orientation, it could be ableness, it could be gender, et cetera, in addressing those inequities. But in either case, whatever the inequity is, there is going to be a cost in changing that dynamic. Namely, usually the loss of a privilege, which is a consequence of justice. At the same time, we know that others attempt to bypass conflict because of their discomfort with the process or the journey of facing difficult conversations and the truths that will come with it. For example, we saw this past summer with a lot of the Black Lives Matter protests that they were handled and reported very differently from other protests that were happening along with it. And then if we go to the public killing of George Floyd, when he said, I can't breathe, even the way that that was covered had very different angles depending upon who was reporting, what their social location was, and what their understanding of BIPOC people was, and also the dynamics that have historically been going on between the uh, police department and BIPOC persons, and in particular, black people and a black man. And I have to just say that I have always been taken aback by how many people here express ignorance of our history, the impact, and the present reality of racism in America. It's quite incredulous to me, frankly, that when so many instances that have sparked outrage and lament have generally always been documented publicly, whether they were splashed across you know, the news in print or in our day, of course, social media, in some form or another, they have been documented, whether they were glorified by one group or lamented and you know, sinful and sad by another group, it was still documented. And there is a long list since slavery times of countless unnamed black people and other BIPOC people who have been killed by police. 
having been viewed even on Sunday afternoons after church as a spectacle when someone was lynched or hung or tarred in a feather or um, put on fire. And most recently, we've seen this kind of behavior in, due, in the lack of due process or consequences for actions against citizens of this country by oftentimes law enforcement. And it has been very convenient in the last 18 months or so that we had something else that would often take our attention away from all these atrocities that were continuing to happen. And I'm speaking of course by COVID, the coronavirus. It was an easy scapegoat, scapegoat to take our attention elsewhere and make the truth even more difficult to hear or confront, but we couldn't help but not see. And then in the midst of all of that, we realized that there were so many people who also refused to avail themselves of the vaccines from COVID. And was this too another excuse of avoiding confrontation because we were screaming about our amendment rights and making it political when it's always been about care for our neighbor, care for our sibling and an issue about human welfare and not politics. But this time, perhaps it's not about that. It's really more about our own responsibility to one another and our own mortality. I think it's hard to fathom how we have so many people continuing to surrender to the impacts of the coronavirus when we have multiple vaccines available, not just one, but multiple. So people even have a choice of what they want to take. And it brings to mind for me, particularly in our US context, the question Jesus asked the person that is laying by the pool when he says, don't you want to be made well? I wanna to say to these folks out here, dude, don't you want to be made well? Girlfriend, what is your problem? Don't you want to be made well? Jesus has through medicine and scientists delivered something that will help us all. Why are you choosing not to be made well? In this story today, the problem of stratification and hierarchy comes up even in the realm of healing. Even still, this story is striking because of this woman's persistence. If we consider that if Jesus did indeed come for the Israelites first and for the rest of us afterwards, then this Syrophoenician woman, this Greek woman, offers a message of hope as she models that perseverance and protest can bring about a new paradigm shift. One can disrupt that which is unjust, that which has been the status quo. This woman's daughter was healed, she was delivered, and she was set free. Folks, it doesn't get any better than this. So how do we tie this to being relevant for us today? How does it speak to our collective context in the US and more importantly, the world? Well, the world is very complicated indeed right now and certainly just as unsettling as this text. In our US context, we seem to love confrontation. Unlike we talk about people running from confrontation, we seem to be a country where most people love confrontation. We seem to thrive on asserting our opinion over others, talking over others, in fact, to shut them down so that our opinion can be made known, and then dismissing and or choosing not to listen to those we deem inferior to us, be that because of race, ethnicity, class, religion, ableness, cognition. We find whatever it is to decide that you're not worthy of expressing your opinion and that mine per se is better than yours. And we might as well just go ahead and add immigration status to that as well, because that seems to be the other big thing as of now since we've ended the war um, in occupying Afghanistan for the last 20 years. And I want to make sure that when I say this, people understand I am not talking about not welcoming back our troops and the work that they did because we do not want another Vietnam. But what I am talking about is the fact that, you know, we have some hatred, hatred hateful vitriol coming out now about receiving these folks that are immigrants. But we fail to remember and we fail to stop and think 
that all of us are immigrants, whether we were forced here or whether we voluntarily chose to come here through our ancestors. So therefore, everyone here is from somewhere else, unless you are a part of the First Nation tribes or you are an American Indian who are native to this land. So why is it then that we want to become exclusionary and decide who gets to come in and who has to stay out? Very truly, I tell you, this makes me sick. This is one of the things that I am not proud about when I hear American people in the US context say, you need to go back where you came from. Because for a country that has been blessed with so much, even in spite of all the sad and shameful things we, do, we have done and continue to do, it is sinful for us not to want to welcome someone and to help them get acclimated to this country. How is this caring for our neighbor? How is this not disrupting the status quo of saying that this country has enough for everyone here and for more? Clearly, we are in struggle and we struggle with confrontation in one way or another. In our country, recent issues continue to be around racism, immigrants or immigration, and non-vaxxers, just to name a few. The general response has included delay, denial, dismissal, and retreat. As I mentioned before, often those who hold the power try to minimize the disagreements or even question, like I mentioned, the veracity of the claims made by those who are othered. Case in point is the matter and death of George Floyd. BIPOC people didn't need a video to believe it was true. As we have lived it, heard the stories, passed down through history, and currently are connected to it in some form of experiencing police profiling and or brutality or death personally, either um, because of people that we know or through our community and friends. The video of George Floyd finally made it real for the dominant white culture that could not fathom this was true. And part of this was because according to their own reality, maybe where they live, there are not a lot of people of color or black people and this had not been part of how they've shown up in the world. This has not been a part of their daily life. So for them, it was not real. Or it could have been those who felt BIPOC persons have had to do something, like we had to do something incredibly horrible for this kind of excessive behavior or brutal behavior to occur. We had to be somehow responsible for that because people who have taken an oath to serve and protect couldn't just do this. And then, of course, there are those who have always known the truth, as they are the racists and the bigots who perform these atrocities and have created and continue to try and create a climate of fear and confrontation. Why? Because they have a vested interest in keeping it going in maintaining this status quo. So you see, the fear of confrontation is really about the outcomes and the costs that are associated with it. At, such as minimizing inequities that will result in diminished opportunities possibly for those who have benefited from their privilege for so long. And we know who those people are. And the sad part is, is that we have to disrupt the status quo in order to level the playing ground, in order to get equity and justice, and to make sure that all of us have a place at the table. Confrontation is not debatable, as Jesus made this abundantly clear in upsetting the status quo every place he went. He managed to piss somebody off every place he went. He willingly engaged in what was considered disruptive behavior by those who wanted to maintain their privilege. Yet Jesus willingly went to these ends of you know, confrontation knowing that it would get him killed. He went to his execution in order to redeem all of us. This is a hard thing to do when we think about what does it mean to disrupt the status quo, to disrupt inequity, to disrupt justice, to disrupt in order to achieve heaven here on earth. But we have to begin to wrap our heads and our hearts around the fact that a loss of privilege or at the very least shared privilege is a consequence of justice and equity. It just is. And we have to remember that meanwhile, we might be pondering this and figuring out how to do this better. 
There are others who are attempting to bypass conflict because of their discomfort with the process or the journey of facing difficult conversations and difficult truths about either their family, this country, or personally themselves. Similarly, I wonder, is it not akin to the fact that we all have something that we need to confront? Again, I will use the coronavirus because there has been a continual refusal by BIPOC and white folks who don't have a medical necessity. I'm not talking about people who have a medical necessity, why they can't take it. But I'm talking about those who just choose to not take it because of what historically has happened to communities of color in the past, even though they know that they've been given information that scientists and scientists of color have helped um, create the vaccines for coronavirus, that the vials that we get for some of those, they have to give eight and 10 doses out of one vial. So it can't be one thing for white people and something else for people of color. We've dismissed those kinds of myths and those untruths and stuff, but still yet, others just want to wait and see. They choose to not avail themselves of the vaccines is for me another confrontation against care for themselves, but more importantly for one another especially those most vulnerable, like our young children, who at this point aren't able to be vaccinated, and others with compromised immune systems who cannot be vaccinated. I have to be honest and say that I am running low on compassion and patience for these folks. As the Delta strain picks up speed here and elsewhere, and people in other countries are unable to receive even the original vaccine, people who want them and they are dying because they are not available to them. They don't come from a wealthy country. They didn't, weren't able to get priority or have enough money to even get enough of the vaccines. While we continue to make advances even to the point where we may be able to offer vaccines to younger children and soon boosters for the immune compromised and the elderly, the most vulnerable in our community. Our siblings south of our borders and elsewhere are pleading for them like the Syrophoenician woman. And they have the right and they are demanding their right to have it while we have multiple vaccines available for folks sitting in refrigerators and freezers that refuse to comprehend the necessity for themselves and moreover for their neighbor and siblings in Christ. You see, we don't get to continue to go without masks. You see, they're returning again. And the return to giant in-person concerts like Summerfest and other festivals didn't even have the kind of lineup that we wanted. People had to cancel because people were getting sick. To travel wherever you want is not gonna simply be able to just get through TSA anymore. You're gonna have to have your COVID card and pretty soon they're gonna have it linked up to the system that even if you have a fraudulent COVID card, when they look you up, if you're not in there, you're not gonna get through. Or what about simply gathering in the places that you like to go, one of them being our sacred and most blessed place, places of worship for us church. How do we do that without confrontations with others at some point? The truth is, is that we have to acknowledge that we are interdependent and our collective situation speaks volumes about this. Collective mutuality is bigger than you and me and the United States. It is a global thing and it is a human thing. So here we are, and we need to ponder this story seriously today. We have to ask ourselves, are we ready and can we be opened like the deaf and the mute man in this story who Jesus healed in private? Can we break free of the judgments and the narratives that render us deaf and mute where we need to hear and then speak with a tongue of justice? and then act and show up to disrupt the status quo. Epitha, be opened, because perhaps we are also in need of a private healing as well. Perhaps the directness of the dialogue between Jesus and this unnamed Syrophoenician woman reminds us to publicly name the differences and to call out the hierarchies and the injustices in our own time in our own community, in our own sphere of influence, in our families even, in our places of work. In order to be delivered from these demons that hold our society and us hostage, 
we have to name things clearly and succinctly. That includes naming even the church's complicity in all of this. The church cannot continue to be complicit in this sad, shameful, and yes, sinful thing and not think that there is a cost. The cost has been called hypocrisy by others. We see a decline in membership because of it. And we choose not to then be Imago Dei, the image of God in flesh, if we don't walk and show up like Jesus. Jesus, Jesus continues to give us living examples of what we're supposed to do. Various ways of how we are to confront inequities and justice and to advocate for ourselves or for others. Epitha, be opened. May we be so bold to be opened and take this step toward full healing and restoration like both of those folks in our texts that were mentioned today. Jesus gives each of us what we need. So I ask you, what is holding you back from being made well? Amen. We'll now have our hymn of the day, Victory is Mine. Thank you, Dr. Rose and Tasha, for the beautiful music for today. We will now have our prayers of intercession. And at any time, if you'd like to enter additional prayers in the comments section, please feel free to do so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Mothering Holy Spirit, let us pray. Good and loving God. We give you thanks for the community of your disciples gathered online today. We thank you for these relationships that have grown strong over the years, as well as for the new friendships that are developing. Strengthen this community of believers. Give us the courage to continue to build beloved community and to follow where the spirit leads in these times of uncertainty knowing that our future is secure when we hope and trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Creator of the cosmos, you are the giver and sustainer of life. And you invite us to tend to your creation with the same love and tenderness that you have shown us. 
But when we look around, we see the earth is crying out from many years of mistreatment with higher temperatures, more severe storms, more wildfires, and more flooding. It's hard to see so many people and creatures hurting and displaced. So today we pray especially for the people of Haiti, the people of Louisiana and New Jersey and New York, and all those affected by the flooding from Ida that stretched all the way up the East Coast. We also pray for everyone impacted by the wildfires that continue to spread on the West Coast. Help politicians, business owners, and all people to stand in awe of your beautiful creation and make decisions that treat every person, creature, and natural resource as sacred. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Lord, today we pray for the people in Milwaukee and all of Wisconsin who are hungry and food insecure. We pray for everyone who's at risk of losing their homes due to the pandemic and loss of work. Help citizens of the cities and counties come together across the miles and across the divides. Help us redistribute the resources so that all children and all people may thrive. Strengthen us for the work you are calling each of us to do in this next season of our lives. May our lives and the ways we spend our time be a holy offering to you. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Jesus, our comforter, fill us with your peace and hope when we feel anxious. Be with those who are sick or suffering and give them the strength needed for the challenges that they're facing. We pray you'll comfort the family and friends of those whom you've called home recently, especially those who lost their lives due to Hurricane Ida, as well as the people and the members of the military who have died recently in Afghanistan. Bring us as citizens with the saints to dwell with them in your house forever. Inspire more people to take the vaccine so that they can prolong the time with loved ones before meeting their creator face to face. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Innovative God, we give you thanks for this technology that allows us to come together across the miles to worship you. Today, we pray for Nurse Linda's sister, Jean, for Pam Gustafson, for Tasha, for Linda Jackson and Michael Ingram, for Chuck Ellingson's aunt, Margaret Ritisky, for Philip Spears, the Adams family, the Hernandez Flores family, Kaylin Blackwell, Pierre Berry, Jeff and Mary Weigert, Adina Williams, Boy Buakanzaya, Kamfua and Conrad Ayala, George Steiger, the Riley family, Beanie Roscoe and Cynthia Munger, Bonnie and Lula Williams, Levon Richie Hayes, Eddie Dunn and Jenny, Tracy Harris and Wayne Pratter, the Hebner family. Julie and Demas Jackson and the Jackson family, the Acevedo family, the Carr Carlson family, the Miller family, Ed and Deanna Williams, Kurt Klaus and Reverend Chris Schub, Will Ladwig and Emery Chernis, Gloria and Bruce Wright, Steve Eckley, Judy and Johnson Hunter, Sally Witte, Janet Williams, John Darren and John Walker, June Torrance, Kevin Blackwell, Chrissy, Roman, Raylan, and Kai Brown, Kenny Murray, Fran and Olivia Love, Deanie Claiborne, Cheryl and Viola Lee, Aroma and Bobby Riley, Craig and Trisha Dent, Carl, Danny, and Dolores Fain, Val D. McCollum, Esma Mitchell and Audrey Fain, Paul Craig, Betty Miner, Ola Reddick, Ricky Bear Davis, Rosalind and Terrence Schaffner, 
Reverend Lindsay Buchelman, Reverends Delaney and Matt Schlake Cruz, Reverends Jess and Matt Short, our partners in transition, Reformation Lutheran, Peace, Wellington Park, Abiding Savior, and Christ Presbyterian. We also pray for all the school teachers, the staff, the children, and the families as they've started school this year, that they will all be safe and healthy and loved as they learn. For all the prayer requests entered in the comments section, as well as all the silent prayers in our hearts, Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. At this time, we'll have our offering prayer, and uh, we want to say thank you for the many ways that you continue to support the ministries here at Cross Lutheran, and you are what enables us to keep these vital ministries going. So thank you for sharing your time, talent, and treasures here with Cross Lutheran, as well as for the many ways that you serve the community around us. We offer all of those things over to you, God, the God of abundance. You cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given to us and unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world that you love so dearly through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now I would invite you to please stand as you are able for the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts as we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is right to give our thanks and praise. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all of humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin, to join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and the hope of your son. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this also for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. I now invite you to recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. So come to this meal and be fed. Amen. I now invite you for everyone at home, or if you happen to be in the park at this time, to please take your elements and commune one another.
Please join me in the post-communion prayer. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. At this time, if you have any announcements that you'd like to share with the rest of the community, please feel free to enter those in the comments section now. I'll let you know that uh, next Sunday will be my last Sunday serving as vicar here at Cross Lutheran, and um, we will be hosting worship uh, outdoors if weather permits, and I hope to get to see you there. And now receive the benediction. Feel the power of Christ's healing love restoring you. Go in peace, offering help and hope to others. And may the peace of God always be with you. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God. And may the peace of Christ be with you always. Please take a moment to share a sign of that peace with people you live with, your neighbors, your family, in person and online. Have a wonderful week.